This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. A quick PSA about auto ads, which are the ones I don't read. I ask my podcast host to not play controversial ads, no politics or religion. Occasionally, I've had one of these ads slip through their filter. And if that is the case, please let me know so I can take care of it. These ads are important because small shows like mine don't get tons of host read ad opportunities. And these canned ads, while annoying, help pay for the cost of the show. Thanks for understanding. A commercial-free version of this podcast is available on Patreon for $1 per month. Patreon.com forward slash Beyond Contempt Podcast. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. I had already left Green Bay and was living in Madison when the scandal unfolded. As I watched this case from afar, it was shocking how systemic the issues were, and it went way beyond one or two priests. The Green Bay Diocese lacked a basic moral compass as they moved child-molesting clergy from city to city. You're listening to Episode 70, The Green Bay Diocese and Reverend John Faney. On May 21, 1978, Father John Patrick Faney stopped in to visit the Merrifield family. Father Faney was affiliated with the Green Bay Diocese and had been assigned to St. Nicholas in Freedom, Wisconsin. The Merrifield family were not regular attendees of St. Nicholas Catholic Church and worshipped at a different parish, but their sons took Bible classes there. Plus, one of their sons was the altar boy at St. Nicholas. So the priest's visit confused yet honored Sharon Merrifield. When the two boys went to bed, Father Faney told Mr. and Mrs. Merrifield that he wanted to hear the kids say their goodnight prayers. Faney stopped in 14-year-old Todd's bedroom first, flipped on the lights, and sat down on the boy's bed. The father started in with Todd, asking if he had a girlfriend. Todd awkwardly responded about concentrating on his studies and didn't want to talk about girls with the priest. Father Faney slid his hand underneath the teenager's shirt and began rubbing his chest. The priest slowly slid his hand down the boy's sternum towards the waistline of his pants. Todd pushed Faney's hand away and rolled onto his stomach, not knowing what else to do. Faney left the room for a while, but quickly returned. He told Todd that he was really not that tired and gave the boy's butt a pinch before leaving the room. Father Faney wandered into 12-year-old Troy Merrifield's room. He turned on the lights and sat down in the boy's bed. Troy's covers had been resting on his shoulders before the priest had pulled them down. Troy immediately pulled the covers up. The young boy and Faney found themselves in a tug-of-war match where the covers were pulled down and yanked up two more times. The priest pulled the covers down one last time and held them there. Faney did the same thing to Troy as he had done to his older brother. His hand went up the boy's shirt, he rubbed his chest, and he worked his way down to the boy's pants. Faney had come within an inch of the child's penis before Troy stopped him and told him to leave. Before Faney stepped out of the room, he kissed the boy's forehead and made the sign of the cross. Mr. Merrifield was climbing up the stairs, wondering what was taking so long, just as Father Faney was heading down. Faney spoke with Mr. and Mrs. Merrifield for a short time before leaving. The next morning, Sharon Merrifield felt both boys were acting strange. When she pressed her sons, Troy said, You think he's great, but he isn't. Then both boys told their mom what happened the night before. Troy told her that Faney asked about his penis and snapped his pajama bottoms. Sharon went to the church elders first. They referred her to one priest and then to another priest, who told her to write up a report. He would take the matter up with the bishop. Months went by and nothing was done. Sharon went to the police in January 1979 and filed a report. District Attorney David Prosser who eventually became a judge on Wisconsin Supreme Court, reviewed Todd and Troy Merrifield's file. He decided to not prosecute the case 
despite the seriousness of the allegations against Father John Faney. Prosser thought there wasn't enough substantial evidence, and he had concerns over the stress that a trial might place on the boys. A trial of this nature would draw publicity with the prosecution of a priest. Plus, Father Faney's brother, Joe, was a well-known tenor singer on the Lawrence Welk Show, which was a popular musical variety show that ran from 1951 to 1982. Once Faney realized Sharon had tried to report him, he told everyone at the parish that Todd and Troy were liars and were accusing him of things he did not do. The Merrifield boys lost friends at school and their family were treated like outcasts. The Merrifields moved forward and didn't dwell on what happened. Instead of investigating the allegations, the Green Bay Diocese moved John Faney to St. Mary in Stockbridge, Wisconsin, where he remained for a short time. In 1983, Father Faney left Wisconsin and moved to California to live near his brother John. Faney left all of his problems and allegations behind in Wisconsin and forged a new affiliation with the Reno and Las Vegas Diocese in Nevada. Fast forward to April 2002. Another victim of Father Faney surfaced and made accusations against the priest. When detectives searched through police records, they found the complaint that Troy and Todd Merrifield made against the father. Detectives re-interviewed the brothers. During the interviews, they unearthed a new piece of information. Troy reported that a month or two prior to John Faney touching him in his bedroom, the priest violated him at a face-to-face confession. The father asked Troy if he had any girlfriends. When Troy responded he had a girlfriend, Faney slid his hand across the boy's jeans and held his hand on the boy's crotch. Faney asked if girls had touched him there and if he knew what body part that he was touching. When Troy responded it was a penis, Faney asked him to spell the word. Troy misspelled the word, likely shocked and flustered. Faney asked him to spell the word again, and Troy spelled it correctly on his second attempt. Faney removed his hand from the boy's groin. Investigators realized that the allegations against Father John Faney were just the tip of the iceberg, and there was a larger problem inside the Catholic Diocese of Green Bay. The diocese had a long and well-established track record of moving priests around until they couldn't outrun their allegations. Then, they were placed on administrative leave. One priest abused and tortured a woman when she was a teen, yet the father was allowed to maintain his position within the church, despite receiving the complaints. They moved another priest after the diocese admitted they forgot to alert the parish to the fact that they should not leave the priest alone with boys, since he was receiving counseling for sexually abusing minors. An Appleton, Wisconsin paper called the Post Crescent searched public records and discovered nine cases of troubled priests that the Diocese of Green Bay had been secretly, quote-unquote, managing. The records were from police, criminal court, and civil court files and spanned five counties in Wisconsin, including Brown, Calumet, Manitowoc, Outagamie, and Winnebago. The diocese declined to comment on the findings. Reverend Eugene Leroy Schmidt had been a pastor at St. Mary's Parish in Winnick County, Wisconsin. He retired in 1991 and in 1992 was sued in civil court by a woman who said he had assaulted her many times when he was a pastor at her church. The assaults took place from 1968, when she was 13, until she was 17 in 1972. The pastor was accused of taking pornographic pictures of the teen He had a dog urinate on her and told her that she was less than a dog and made her lap up water out of a dog dish. The priest took the teen to strip clubs in both Milwaukee and Green Bay. Schmidt violated the girl with a broomstick and he asked the teen to marry him. The case was dismissed because the statute of limitations expired. At the time of the assaults, neighbors that lived by the church were alarmed when they noticed the teen was spending too much time in the rectory and called the Green Bay Diocese. The diocese wrote Father Schmidt a letter and told him to be more careful. The priest showed the letter to the teen, 
This was the extent of their intervention. In 1992, the woman was an adult and wrote to Green Bay Bishop Ilotius Wysilo. She detailed how Father Schmidt used his position in the church to gain her trust, then abused her. They moved the father to St. Vincent's Church in Oshkosh, and he remained there until 1989. A court-appointed psychiatrist diagnosed the victim with multiple personality disorder, which resulted from the alleged assaults. The woman did not tell anyone sooner because she was embarrassed and wanted to shield her family from the fallout. In January 1983, a rape counselor called a meeting between the victim and Father Schmidt. He did not deny any of the accusations and instead asked for forgiveness since he felt he was doing good work. The father believed they should leave him do that work. In March 1983, the victim wrote a letter to Milwaukee Archbishop Rembrandt Weekland and was unhappy about the lack of response she received from the Green Bay Diocese. Unsurprisingly, the bishop wasn't receptive to the letter and later on found himself on the receiving end of sexual abuse accusations. In May 2002, the bishop retired at the mandatory age of 75. They revealed that the archdiocese paid out $450,000 to a former seminarian who studied at Marquette University and accused Weakling of sexual assault two decades prior. Weakling admitted it happened, apologized, and later came out as gay. In February 1986, there was a memo on diocese letterhead that suggested the victim of Father Schmidt should receive a monetary offer for living expenses and for further treatment needs. The next priest, Father Ronald Schneider, was transferred between parishes in Nina and Oshkosh in the late 1980s. He was trying to outrun sexual assault allegations an anonymous party filed a police report in Oshkosh in 1992. In the report, Schneider had two incidents with underage boys when he was at Sacred Heart Church, where he was posted from 1975 to 1985. The parents previously filed complaints with the diocese. Father David Kiefer was a vicar of the priests for the diocese and acknowledged these complaints when police interviewed him in 1992. Father Kiefer told law enforcement that Father Schneider had problems with voyeurism. He asked the boys to take their clothes off in front of him. They transferred Father Schneider to St. Margaret Mary in Nina, where he remained until 1988. Father Kiefer said that the diocese forgot to inform the new church of the allegations against Schneider. Of course, Father Schneider worked with young boys at his new post, where he assisted in training altar boys and worked with the Boy Scouts program. Father Kiefer referred to this oversight as, quote-unquote, slipping through the cracks. Father Schneider was undergoing counseling, and as a part of that counseling was not supposed to have contact with children. The father was transferred to Sacred Heart in Oshkosh in 1989, and they sent along a written warning about his issues with children, and he was not to be around kids while unsupervised. Father Ronald Schneider was never charged with a crime or sued in civil court. In 1983, he was placed on administrative leave by the diocese. The Reverend Thomas Ronald Stocker was posted at St. Joseph's in Green Bay and Boniface Parish in De Pere in 1963. He moved to Washington, D.C. in 1969 to study at the Catholic University of America. In 1978, Stocker was the pastor at St. Mary's Parish in Greenleaf, Wisconsin, until they moved him to the town of Cooperstown in 1989. In 1994, he was moved to St. Agnes Parish in Green Bay, and someone named him in a civil suit, where four male victims said he sexually assaulted them from 1963 to 1967. The assaults took place in a variety of cities. One was at an outdoor movie theater in Green Bay. Another was in an Oshkosh motel, and yet another in a Chicago home. One assault took place in the priest's car. During a deposition, the priest admitted to having sexual contact with one victim. In 1995, the diocese placed Thomas Ronald Stocker on leave. The civil cases never made it through the court system, and they were dismissed 
because they exceeded the statute of limitations. Reverend Robert Bruce Thompson started his career in St. Francis Xavier Cathedral in Green Bay in 1965. He taught classes at high school in Oshkosh in 1967 and was involved with coordinating campus ministries at UW Oshkosh in 1969. Thompson was a chaplain at Winnebago County Mental Health Institute in 1978. In 1984, he moved to Tucson, Arizona and helped at a hospital. In 1987, Thompson moved to Corpus Christi, Texas and worked for another hospital. They named Thompson in the same 1994 civil suit as Reverend Thomas Ronald Stocker. Thompson's alleged role in the crime was he watched and encouraged Stocker to commit the abuse. The Green Bay Diocese also placed Thompson on administrative leave in 1995, and he died in 1999. Reverend Monsignor Edward Michael Witchek started working at St. Dennis Parish in Shiocton in 1960, then was appointed to the faculty of Sacred Heart Seminary in Oneida the same year, and eventually was named rector. In 1972, he worked at Annunciation Parish in Green Bay, then moved to St. Anthony Neopit in 1975. In 1986, Witchek worked at Holy Name Retreat House on Chambers Island, which is in Door County. They moved him to St. Elizabeth Sexton in Green Bay in 1991. In 1991, the victim met with the priest to discuss sexual abuse she sustained when she was younger, and that was when he assaulted her. Edward Michael Witchek pleaded no contest to four misdemeanor counts involving sexual contact with the victim in 1999. Reverend Leroy Jerome Hogan was a pastor at St. Edward in Mackville in 1979 and was moved to St. Patrick's in Askeaton, Wisconsin in 1991. They filed a civil suit against him in 1993, and the diocese placed him on administrative leave. The 14-year-old victim alleged he was assaulted from age 7 to 9, from 1985 to 1987, when he was a student in St. Edward and Mackville. The priest denied everything and settled out of court. Bishop Robert Banks of the diocese paid the victim $25,000 cash and also provided a $40,000 annuity to fund any continued treatment needs. Leroy Hogan retired in 1997. Reverend Stanley Thomas Brown was a pastor at St. Peter and Paul in Green Bay from 1981 to 1984. He also worked in Appleton, Hollandtown, and Brussels. They posted Brown at St. Mary of the Lake in Lakewood, Wisconsin, when he was placed on administrative leave. They accused him of sexually abusing a minor when he worked in Green Bay in the 1980s. I think many of my listeners are similar to me. You like mysteries and true crime, especially in podcast form. That's why I love the new podcast, A Study of Strange. The show dives deep into the most fascinating tales of the unknown, including true crime and stories of high strangeness. A Study of Strange is hosted by Michael May, the filmmaker and host behind the mystery true crime TV shows on Motor Trend TV, Autobiography, and Autobiography Cold Cases. You can tell. Michael is obsessed with these stories, and he really gets into the research. Each week, Michael invites a guest onto the show to help him debunk misconceptions, discover new theories, and they also act out reactions. Recent episodes include a bizarre unsolved murder in New Hampshire, which might have been committed by German spies in 1917. And another one is an interview with a man who claims he knows Usha Beggy Smalls. I think you're really going to enjoy this podcast. So definitely check out A Study of Strange. Find A Study of Strange at www.astudyofstrange.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, let's circle back to Reverend John Patrick Faney, who was posted at 14 parishes in 14 years. He started his career in 1952 at St. Joseph's in Green Bay, then moved to Kiwani then Sturgeon Bay in 1954, Clintonville in 1955, and Oshkosh in 1956. The first allegation against the priest was after he touched an underage girl during confession in 1958, 
when he was posted at the Holy Redeemer Church in Two Rivers. They moved Father Faney to Appleton in 1961, Chilton and Cloton in 1963, Clark's Mills in Flintville in 1965, and Francis Creek, Maplewood, and Watoma in 1966. In August 1966, they assigned him to both Holy Family Parish in El Cio and St. Mary Mission in Pickerel. In 1969, De Pere. In 1973, Swamico and Little Swamico. In 1976, Freedom, when he touched the Merrifield Brothers. And in 1979, Stockbridge. Bishop Ilocious Wasilo approved Fanny's transfer in 1979, despite allegations from the Merrifield family. Fanny denied he assaulted the girl in 1958 in Two Rivers, and the lawsuit was settled out of court. The attorney for the girl had a hard time extracting information from the diocese as to the whereabouts of Father Fanny, since he was moved so frequently. The attorney was concerned that the diocese had destroyed or removed the files on Fanny, since there was at least one notation that stated, Materials Removed. In 1978, he denied snapping the pajama bottoms of Todd and Troy Merrifield and asking questions about the private parts. In September 1978, the diocese board met and decided that if Faney stayed at his post in Freedom, Wisconsin, he needed counseling. There was evidence that Bishop Wysilo wrote a letter to Father Faney and told him to stay away from young people and he needed to be more prudent during confession. When Faney was sent to Stockbridge in 1979, Bishop Wysilo told him via letter that if there was a repeat of his past problems, or if there was a trial because of any allegations, he would be suspended. Besides all of Faney's known victims, there had been widespread rumors and accusations of inappropriate sexual behavior when he was in Appleton, Swamico, De Pere, and Chilton. <laughs> On October 3, 1983, on the night before Bishop Wysilo resigned, he wrote a letter to Father Faney and said he was not allowed to serve the Green Bay Diocese. Faney had three months to find another job, and the bishop promised to provide him a positive letter of reference. The bishop suggested that another atmosphere, new people, and fresh faces were in Faney's best interest. It is a pity that serving the Diocese of Green Bay for 30 years ends in this way, but really, haven't we all tried? If Faney could not land somewhere else by January 1, 1984, he would have to enter a treatment program or face prosecution for his past allegations. I think you see the wisdom of this alternative, since time and time again I have been advised by civil servants, specifically the Attorney General, that unless the diocese promised to provide treatment, you would be prosecuted. It was unclear if the bishop was referring to then Attorney General Bronson LaFollette, who claimed to not remember this case. They transferred John Faney to a parish in San Diego, where he served for a short time, until he moved to St. Francis de Sal in Las Vegas in 1984. They accused him of molesting a 13-year-old boy in 1984 and 1985. He allegedly took the boy and his friends to a football game, and then after the game, he went to the boy's home. Faney sat on the couch with the youth and placed his arm around him. Faney wanted to know if the boy had the Playboy channel, then slid his hand under the boy's shirt and put his other hand down the boy's pants. In 1984, Faney moved out of state to Armagrosa Valley, then Indian Springs, Nevada. In Indian Springs, he worked at a prison and was accused of soliciting sexual favors from inmates. The father smuggled in women's underwear and drug paraphernalia to use as trading collateral. In December 1986, Faney was told that he had to resign. The incident at the prison was finally a bridge too far for Bishop Adam Maeda, the Green Bay Diocese had Father Faney listed as out on sick leave from 1987 to 1990, but he was in treatment programs that the Green Bay Diocese paid for. In 1987, they sent Faney to a treatment program in Maryland, where they told him his sexual disorder was not treatable. In 1989, he went to another treatment program in New Mexico. 
He still served in local churches while going through those programs. Father Faney officially retired in 1991 and was living in Los Angeles, California. Some of the other accusations lodged at him during his time as a priest were molesting a 15-year-old boy when he was visiting relatives in California in 1967, sodomizing a 14-year-old boy in 1969, swimming and showering in the nude with young boys in the early 1970s, touching two teen girls at a church retreat, also in the early 1970s, for which he was sent to counseling and sexually assaulting a boy from 1978 to 1981. In 1994, Faney was sued, and they settled the civil suit out of court in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. In 2002, Bishop Robert Banks formed a task force to examine the personnel files of all Wisconsin priests who were accused of sexual abuse. The task force did not name names, but listed 39 priests who had abused minors since 1859, and six were being looked at by district attorneys. Investigators revisited John Faney's case in June 2002. Church sexual abuse cases reached a critical mass that year, when the Catholic Archdiocese of Boston sex abuse scandal was blasted in the national news. On September 16, 2002, 75-year-old John Patrick Faney was arrested at his apartment in Los Angeles. There was a six-year statute of limitations on sexual assault in Wisconsin, but the Ottagami County District Attorney, Vince Biscupic, said because Faney left the state, that placed a pause on that six-year timer. Faney assaulted the Merrifields in 1978, and he moved out of state in 1983. Faney was extradited to Wisconsin, and on October 2, 2002, they set his bail at $400,000 with the justification that he was a rogue priest who preyed upon children. At a hearing on October 9, 2002, his bond was reduced from $400,000 to $100,000 because of a lack of prior convictions. Faney's attorney, Gerald Boyle, also argued that the statute of limitations had already expired and leaving the state should not have suspended the time limit. He said that the statute's limits were only paused for suspects who left the state to hide, and their whereabouts were unknown. Boyle said Faney was receiving a pension from the Diocese of Green Bay, and they knew where he was living. Faney was prohibited from leaving the state, he surrendered his passport, he was not allowed to contact victims as a condition of his bail. His attorney expected his bond to be paid, since they received many calls from people who wanted to help, and they were going to set up an apartment in Sheboygan for the priest. Faney never admitted to the charges. I certainly deny any allegations. I've always been willing to face things. It seems to me the allegations were resolved decades ago. It's not quite fair to resurrect them. The very thing of having the allegations mentioned now seems like a death sentence. What seems to be driving the media right now is all the church cover-up. That's a legitimate concern, but in my case, there was no hint of that. A task force was set up by officials inside the church to examine the accusations of sexual assault of minors by priests. Faney said, I think it is necessary for the church to face whatever problems there may be. They charged Father John Faney with four counts of attempted sexual assault and one count of sexual assault of a child. Faney's trial began on February 23, 2004. Seven men and six women were chosen from a pool of 73 potential jurors. 39-year-old Todd Merrifield testified and recounted how the priest asked him about girlfriends, inappropriately touched him in his bedroom, and later pinched his butt. When defense attorney Gerald Boyle cross-examined Todd, he got the witness to admit that when his younger brother Troy came to his room and asked if anything had happened, he said no. Todd explained he was so shocked that he didn't want to talk about it, especially since the priest was such an authority figure. Boyle went through two reports that were filed in 1979, then in 2002. In the 1979 report, it said the boys shared a room, and in 2002, they had separate rooms. Todd told the defense attorney that it was an obvious error, 
since they never shared a room. Todd estimated Fanny was in his room for five to ten minutes. His younger brother told their mom what happened, and that was what prompted Todd to admit he was assaulted. The younger sibling, Troy Merrifield, testified and explained the assault at confession and a few months later in his bedroom. He estimated Fanny was in his room for less than five minutes. Sharon Merrifield thought Fanny was upstairs in the boys' room for approximately 10 minutes. During closing arguments, the prosecution said this about the Merrifield brothers. They were sought out for the most part. They had moved on with their lives. This was not a case where they went to law enforcement. Law enforcement came to them. There were moments during the trial that the 77-year-old John Faney appeared to be nodding off, and at other times his eyes were closed and his hands were folded as if in prayer. After six hours, the jury reached a verdict on February 27, 2004. They found John Faney guilty of three counts of attempted sexual assault of a child and one count of sexual assault of a child. After the verdict, the judge allowed Faney to remain free on the $100,000 cash bond until sentencing. Troy Merrifield said, Hopefully he will die in jail, and then he'll face God's punishment. He belonged behind bars a long time ago. Todd Merrifield was proud to be standing in for all the other anonymous victims of Faney's that never got their day in court. There's a lot of injury and hurt out there. It is a relief today. I am thankful that it is done. I wish the others had their shot at justice. The other ones don't have a voice, and there is a lot of them out there. The prosecutor had ten other victims on his witness list, where the statute of limitations ran out for their situations. And that was only a fraction of Fanny's victims. They never had to testify since the judge had strict rules about what they could say in his courtroom. The prosecutor was pleased that the Green Bay Diocese had worked with him on the case. Bishop David Zubik of the Green Bay Diocese issued a statement. With the guilty verdict rendered against Father John Faney, I take this opportunity to apologize to those who have been hurt by Father Faney's actions and to pray for them. In the season of Lent, We are reminded by our Lord Jesus Christ that he died for all our sins so each of us could experience the forgiveness of our Father. May God bring healing to those who have suffered because of Father Faney's actions. And may God have mercy on Father Faney. The judge sentenced John Faney to 15 years in prison on April 30, 2004. He was eligible for mandatory release in 10 years, according to Wisconsin law. It could be paroled as early as three years and nine months. The judge told Faney, I want to structure a sentence that will bring us to the end of your life. Faney's attorney tried to appeal his sentence, but those motions were denied. On January 9, 2005, Bishop David Zubik finally asked the Vatican to defrock John Faney. And on August 8, 2005, Pope Benedict XVI officially defrocked the convicted priest. In November 2011, 84-year-old John Faney was released from prison after serving eight years and was transferred to a halfway house in Appleton. Faney was placed on the National Sex Offender Registry and was moved to the VNA Renewal Center in Dither, Missouri, where the church sent child molesting clergy. In 2008, SNAP, or the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, sued the Green Bay Diocese. The church moved Fanny from post to post all across Wisconsin, despite knowing he molested children, which facilitated Fanny molesting the Merrifield brothers. SNAP had filed several lawsuits in Milwaukee for similar reasons. They also wanted the Green Bay Diocese to release the names of 51 priests who preyed upon children. Deacon Tim Riley responded to the allegations and said they were preposterous. The church planned to fight them. In May 2012, a jury decided that the Catholic Diocese of Green Bay covered up John Faney's history of molesting children when they moved him city to city. They awarded Todd and Troy Merrifield $700,000 
because the Catholic diocese were at fault by assigning Fanny to their parish, knowing he was a danger to children. The verdict was thrown out because there was an issue with a jury member, and the judge questioned their impartiality. A retrial was scheduled, but the Green Bay Diocese settled with the Merrifield brothers out of court, and Bishop David Ricken offered them a public apology. Snap and the Merrifield brothers still wanted the bishop to take accountability and release the names of the other 50 priests who had been accused of molesting children. The Green Bay Diocese were sued again, this time in Nevada in November 2012. A victim of John Faney's was awarded $500,000 because the priest assaulted them in 1984 when he was posted in Las Vegas. The diocese appealed the case, and they overturned it at the state Supreme Court level in 2015. In 2019, the Green Bay Diocese finally released the names of 46 clergy who had substantiated accusations of abusing minors. Only 15 of the 46 clergy were still alive. Bishop David Ricken apologized to the 98 known victims. They posted the names of the priests on the church's website at noon, and at 12.01, the website crashed because of high traffic volume. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for the links to the sources and music used in this episode. Research, writing, editing, audio production, and sound design were performed by me, Renee. If you like the show, please leave me a positive review in Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thank you so much, everyone. Stop.